get into baked, when you get above the boiling temperature of water, nutrients start to be lost at a much faster degree. So baking is a lot less healthier in that regard. And then finally, you get frying at the very end, which I would I would not recommend frying very often because uh, fat, you know, just extra fat. And we, in general, we do not need those those fats in our diet. With that said, if you want to, if you love French fries and you want to splurge and you want to have some French fries, and that's one of the rules in here. I will bond with the yeah because I don't know the page, but one of the rules in here is. You should treat treat foods like it is a treat. So if you want French fries, you shouldn't run to McDonald's and get yourself an order of French fries. You should sit down, you should cut up a potato, you should throw some oil in it, get it hot, and make that French fry yourself. It will taste way better because of it. And the idea that the idea that Michael has is that because you're taking all of that time, frying foods takes a long time if you're not in a restaurant setting. So if you're going through all that effort, you're less likely to eat them. But on top of that, there's there's always the freshness factor. There's always the processing. I didn't really talk about processing, but less processed. You know, that's why you want to grow your own food. The more processing that goes into it, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, one thing I'll say about being vegetarian, omega-3 fatty acids is very much something that should be on your mind. It's in meat. If you eat meat, you do not need to worry about omega-3s at all. I had a giant lump thing in my shoulder that was there because I had mistreated my body. I marched drum for I carried a 60 pound drum around the field 10 hours a day. So I'd abused my body. But the fact that I didn't have omega-3 fatty acids meant that my joints weren't getting, basically it works, it does a lot in your body, but one of the features is it kind of acts like lubricant in, in your joints. So my joints were just cracking up and I grew this giant thing. And once I started introducing omega-3s, that's, eggs is a good source. Again, eggs are one of those things that they're gonna have drugs in it, and you want, you want like, you check out the eggs here, you want that farm fresh, you want eggs that have been allowed, chickens that have been allowed to scratch for food. Uh, you don't want growth hormones in the eggs. You don't, there's a lot of, a lot of times in the grocery store when you get just all the white eggs, those have been bleached. You don't want your eggs bleached. But those are a great source of omega-3. Uh, also flax, we have a ton of flax oil. I do not recommend flax oil unless you're cooking something big. It will go bad very quickly. Flax seed, flax seed that you're milling yourself is the best source, but pre-milled -milled flax seed will last for a couple months on a shelf and a year in, in, the, in the fridge. And then hemp is the other really high natural source. Hemp is something that's been less popular because lots of government bullcrap rules, but it is becoming more popular and we're starting to see it more often. And it's something that's available to buy now. Uh, I'm in... Like if you have hemp seed, yes. how long is it? I don't know. Is it like a year? Is it like a year? Yeah, it's like a year. Yeah, it's like a year. Okay. Yeah, it's like a year. 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 Yeah, it's like a I mean, honestly, like cracked black pepper should probably be kept in the fridge. You should just buy whole peppercorns because you know that's that's where the problem lies from. Uh, like I said, the, the more you process it, the more it becomes able to lose nutrients to the atmosphere. So pre-cracked, pre-ground pepper, pre-ground hemp, all that stuff is more able, and you want to keep it at a lower temp because of that. Uh, I mentioned soy a little bit. Soy really, it's been like trumped up as something that's good for us. It's really not. It does, uh, it does really screwy things with your, with your estrogen levels. It, uh, it gets in your stomach and it's really hard for your stomach to process and digest. So eating a ton of tofu is a really bad source for a vegetarian because that tasty leafy green salad that you just ate, you're going to be less able to digest the protein and the nutrients in that because of the tofu that's on top of it. Uh, actually, wheat, while we're on the subject, wheat has a really similar quality where wheat will get in your stomach and it will just turn to paste and it will line your intestine and it becomes impossible to digest things. They have a ton of sprouted, sprouted grain bread here. If you're going that level, I highly recommend sprouted grain. Yeah, no, wheat, wheat is very, very bad for us, I would even say. Yeah, uh, white white flour in particular, avoid white flour all the time, never eat it. Whole, whole wheat or multi-grain flours tend to be a lot healthier for us. 
sprouted grain being the best soap. And sprouted grain, you know, if you have a bread that's sprouted grain with flaxseed and multiple different kinds of grains, that, that'll actually be pretty healthy for you. It'll be efficient protein. Um, something else about protein, fun fact, it's easier to digest warm. So I, I heat up all of my wheat. I never eat wheat products at room temperature. Your body will make far more efficient use of the proteins in it when it's been heated. That's why, again, we cook meat, your body more readily digests the protein in those meat from that. Uh, there's a ton, there's a rack in here, and then back that in like the far corner, there's a freezer, and they have a bunch of sprouted grain breads here. They have the cheapest prices in town for sprouted grain breads too, actually. I live down the street from Walner's, and it actually costs double to buy my sprouted grain bread from Walner's than it does for here. So this place is awesome in that regard. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm about to get to that. This place isn't either. Uh, I want to talk about the other, the other protein sources though, which the real common ones that we think that you should think of are rice and beans. You, if you mix rice and beans, you pretty much have a complete protein. How your stomach works, you, it will keep proteins in it for up to 24 hours. So if you have rice today and beans tomorrow, your stomach will make a complete protein. You don't, you don't need to worry about balancing it every day. And that's where that listening to your body thing comes in. Because I will have cravings for beans. Yeah. That's a good question. All kinds of rice. <laughs> you, you want, again, you want minimally processed. So preferably they have a rack right over here where they have a bunch of like, they'll have organic long grain rice for two bucks. I would just not, not get caught in. Again, you don't want processed. You don't want that it's been bleached. Uh, ideally, you get whole grain, some kind of whole grain rice. But I would recommend buying a whole big bunch of different kinds, seeing what they taste like, seeing what your body craves, and then keep rotating. Don't, if you get stuck buying one, then you have a chance to have a deficiency. But if you're constantly changing the, the type of rice or the type of, you know, you get red beans and you get garbanzo beans, Pinto beans, black beans, you're, the constantly changing nutrients will make it a lot easier for you to, to get what you really need. Yeah? You said rice and bleach. Yeah, rice and bleach. Bleach. Meats be bleached too, very commonly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing that happens in, in, the, in the realm of the food industry is that, because the, the ideal is, you know, every egg looks exactly the same. Every grain of rice looks exactly the same. And so what happens is you get, or meat, meat's a really good example. You get meat that comes through and they take 100 cows and they ground it down into one giant log, which in itself that's unhealthy because if one of those cows was sick, all of that meat is now tainted with that sickness. And then it'll be, you know, it'll be like the gross green color because it's been overexposed to oxygen or it'll be like a light pink color and they want that like luscious bright red color. So what they do is they bleach it to kill off all the disease, and then they dye it the color that they want it. So you get a lot of eggs that are white because they've been bleached because they might have a slight yellow color, and that's not considered the ideal. Uh, rice, certain kinds of white rice, how they make them white is they either cut part of the plant off, which you want to always eat the whole plant, and I'll talk about that in a second too. You always, so they'll cut part of the plant off or they'll bleach it, and that's how they get it white. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's really hard and it involves a lot of really good questions, but places like this start making it a lot easier on us than Wally World would. Uh, okay, I think I got two more things and then I'll go back there and show you guys get some food actually going for us. Uh, one is, okay, so how I view eating is really historical. I've come to call it evolutionary eating. The stuff that was once upon a time good for us, the Mediterranean diet, that's the big one we know. We, I hope we've all heard that term before. The Mediterranean diet of olive oil, uh, lots of hummus, maybe some, some lamb, lots of greens and veggies. That's, a, that's something that's very much been, you know, been tossed out at us. And the reason we know it's healthy is because it's been proven, you know? The people have been living that way in Greece for 5,000 years, and there's, 110 year old grandmas walking around that look like they're still 50 years old. There's 60 year old guys walking around looking like they're in their 20s. Uh, another another diet that's been proven is China. China has 
they do lots of rice, they do lots of veggies, and then they do a very small amount of meat. And that has been proven to be a healthy diet. So really digging into what our ancestors ate and figuring out what was healthy for them can help us figure out what's healthy for us because of course that's how we evolve around those products. And in that regard, that leads me to my final issue, which is GMOs. It is near impossible to ignore or to, to avoid GMOs in today's world, which is just unfortunate, but it's how it is. And having the right mindset towards them can really help with that. I think that we should just avoid them all. I do not trust the science at all. As I said out of this book, it's, a, it's very easy to manipulate the science because we don't quite know what we're looking for yet. So what happened was Monsanto had a 10 year period where they tried out canola, soy, a few other things. And then they said, okay, there's no negative side effects and they push it through. Well, if you think about what they're doing to the plant on a, a molecular and cellular level, it's not necessarily something that we're gonna notice immediately. 10 years isn't necessarily enough. Personally, I think that we should give it three lifetimes because we, we could have, you know, our grandkids could be born with terrible defects because the GMOs we're eating, and we don't even know it's going to happen yet because we haven't studied it for long enough. So my general mindset is that we should avoid them all the time. Now, the way to do that is, first of all, familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with the crops. Soy, uh, cotton, let's see, there's, I, I think it's a salmon. There's some kind of fish that's been approved. Oh, yeah, check salmon, that. salmon. Yeah, it's salmon? Okay. Um, corn, those are, those are the big ones. Meat that is meat that has eaten corn. Most of the corn that we grow in this country isn't for people. Most sweet corn actually is not GMO. But the corn that we feed to the cows is. So that cow becomes in itself genetically modified. And then we eat it and get that. Uh, the other way to really avoid it is to, as, I, as I've been hammering on, avoid the processed foodstuffs. Uh, you know, you're, you're not gonna have high fructose corn syrup in bread that you made at home. You're gonna have it in bread that you buy from the store, and that, that's where the GMO enters. But if you, if you buy it at home, if you go to the local baker, these are people that you can hold responsible for it. Uh, I will say this too, this, when I talked to these guys, I called them up for the March Against Monsanto. They, they set up a booth there, which is really cool of them. And the lady I talked to on the phone made sure to say, you know, we have GMOs on our shelves. We can't avoid having GMOs on our shelves. And the problem with that, what it comes down to, is the labeling issue. It's, it's just considered, oh, it's safe, you're fine, go, go get it. Well, if it's really that safe, they shouldn't be afraid to hide behind a big old sign saying this is a genetically modified product and decide for themselves. So I really encourage you all to do, do some research into the labeling issue because I know that the guys who run this, this, not just this store, but this whole chain, they want labeling. Because to figure out, you know, when you have a third party product that's been made from a guy that was made from a guy that was grew somewhere else, that, you know, the seeds were sold from somewhere else, to figure out if that's a genetically modified product or not, you have to do a lot of back research. And it's just, you're, you're gonna have a whole staff that that's all they do, and there's no way to really guarantee it. So getting, getting labeling as a legal issue would mean that whoever they buy the product from, that person has to know. And it makes it very easy and very, very easy to hold people accountable for, for all of these actions. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much my whole talk. That's everything I have to say to basics. Like I said, this was this was a really basic course. I'm gonna be doing these every week, hopefully. The next one's in two weeks, but hopefully after that will be every week. And I'm gonna do a lot more cooking in the future, but I just wanted to, to give you guys an idea into my mindset because I think that the way you think about food affects the decisions you allow yourself to make. And that in the end will determine what gets in your belly and how you feel about it. So the final thing I want to talk about is, is knife skills. Um, if you cook, you know, five five meals a week, so dinner Monday through Friday every week, and you you have the right mindset to a knife, in 20 years you are going to chop things very very quickly. I work at a restaurant, so and I do the prep shift at the restaurant, so I go in there at six in the morning and I just cut so many peppers, and I cut so many tomatoes, and that, obviously that's like a gateway to, to very rapidly improving your skills. But it's something that you should look for in the long run. It starts off 
consistency, doing the same stroke every time and having the right kind of stroke. So, it's back, you have to pitch it down. <laughs> um, how I, first of all, you want a big old knife like this. This is 90% of the time, this is the knife you want to use. Rather than buying like a fancy $200 knife set, I would buy a $200 chef's knife. Uh, you want to think about the weight, where, where it's weighted. So this one is weighted just about there. That's a well-balanced knife, that's where it should be. So I'm going to wrap my hand. This knuckle is the one that you use to guide you. I'm going to wrap that around there. This finger, I see people hanging down, I see people on top, I see people pointing. I move, honestly. Like I Sometimes I chop so much, I've got a big old callus right there, and it'll get kind of painful, and I'll move the finger around. But uh, something, something like that. And then you want to think about, there's really two points. Like this whole thing is a lever. We all remember, hopefully, middle school physics, right? Leverage. So you want to think about the point, and then you want to think about this muscle right here. It's not much of an action, it's mostly mostly gravity doing the work for me. But you just want to drop it, drop it down right there. Got, got some pineapple to show you guys what I mean. So you just want to, I'm thinking about this point, I'm thinking about the weight of my arm right here dropping into this point, and it's it's a through motion. It's not it's not an up and down, it's a rocking motion, and the curve of the blade is what makes it go up and down. So you just slide it through just like that. So and if you can do that stroke that stroke every single time, you will naturally speed will come. You know speed speed is a measure of practice. So eventually you get one of those down, and you just start start slicing it as fast as you can. But in the meantime, like I said, you just really want to think about this: the weight of your arm and the surface you're cutting into, and just going. If you have a sharp knife, you should go straight through it. Oh, another thing: you really, really, really want to make sure you have a sharp knife because if you have a dull knife and you try and cut through something. You might hit a sharp, like a hard pocket of the, the fruit of what you're cutting into, and your knife will skid. And when your knife skids, that's when you cut your finger off. You, if you use the right technique and you pay attention, you will never have a problem with cutting yourself. With that said, paying attention can be a hard part too. I, uh, I have a little tip of my finger missing when I was cutting some basil because I did one of those. Don't do that. <laughs> but yeah, you can see. I've, I've got it down where I cut very quickly by this point. And as I said, this is something that it's not alien. Everyone, everyone should be working on their knife technique because ideally you get to a point where something that used to take you, you know, you look online and it says this recipe takes 20 minutes to make. And then you make it and it takes you like two hours. You're like, oh my god, why did that take so long? Well, that's a measure of not necessarily knowing knowing uh, the right knife technique and slicing stuff quickly, but also knowing you know, how to make the recipe. But uh, getting, getting those knife techniques down can very much improve your speed. So that's something we should all be shooting for. Okay, um, another thing I wanted to talk about, actually, using the entirety of the plant. So we have, we have a very, uh, I guess, wealthy, way of looking at it where we have, you know, we grow way more food than we need to eat every year. So lots of food goes to waste. 40% of the food that's grown in America right off the bat goes to waste. Restaurants will just have exorbitant amounts of waste. Uh, as I said, I know I do the prep shift every morning. I slice the pepper in half and I take that part in the middle into the trash. That part in the middle actually is a uh, here, I'll show you guys on this. I don't have pepper remains, unfortunately. There's two things you really, really want to look for in a plant, and that is white parts and seeds. Obviously, this avocado seed, maybe not something we can eat. Might, might be a little hard on your digestion, but like, I hear people all the time tell me, oh, did you know that, insert fruit here, seeds contain cyanide? Well, that's, that's natural. There's a lot of fruits that their seeds have cyanide in it, and that's because if, if you're thinking about like a really small pest, that's going to nibble into the seed and ruin the seed by you know only eating half of it, well, you probably want to kill that. You don't want that to eat your seeds. 
what a lot of plants want is for you to eat the seed whole. The seed has a protective outer shell. It will go the whole way through your digestion and you will drop it out of your body in a little pile of fertilizer. So, see, so seeds are, are something that, you know, like that, it has cyanide in it. Well, it's a protective measure. And the other thing that apple seeds, apricot seeds, tons of seeds have is certain kinds of B vitamins that help your body digest cyanide. So it's not actually unhealthy for you at all. It's actually quite good for you. So in this case, we saw the pineapple top, right? Like I was ripping all the leaves off. This is the very, very top of the pineapple. As we can see, it's white. It has the seeds in it. Those are the two criteria I said. Uh, the first time I made a smoothie with this stuff in it, like it's, it's a little bit bitter, so I would not recommend eating it raw at all. It doesn't quite go well with our taste buds. But if we make smoothies, with uh, you know, with juices in them, then the, you know, juices, the rest of the pineapple, all that, your body will will react really well to this because it's just loaded with natural sugar. I I honest to God, I felt like I was flying, like I was just walking around, and I felt like I was 20 feet above my body the first time because it's so loaded with natural antioxidants and natural sugars and tons of good healthy parts. Uh, I've got a line here that I saved the inside of too. You can see the peel, right? The peel is the white part. The, the seed is inside the lime, obviously. But this part right here, when I'm making smoothies at home, if I use a, if I use a lime or an orange or something, something like this that has this big old thick peel on it, I'll take a spoon and I'll actually scrape this white part in, out and throw it into the smoothie. And then I'll get, again, this is loaded with antioxidants vitamins and new, tons of nutrients your body wants. Uh, I don't know where a spoon is in this demo kitchen or I would throw that into the smoothie I'm <laughs> going to make for you guys. But yeah, that's something, that's something I would really, really challenge because I see so much food waste at home, at the store, all that. Uh, I mentioned earlier spinach. You might want to cook spinach that's been sitting a little longer and is halfway rotten. The other thing about it though is that vitamins are very much a living a living substance. So as you, as it sits, as the spinach gets closer to rotting, there's actually other nutrients in the spinach that basically become a lot. They grow, and they might, you know, the the one nutrient, like the bulk of the nutrients, are going to be lost to oxidation because it's gone. But the other stuff in the plant might actually grow and develop, and in that way, it will continue to become healthier in a different way. And you might want to cook it to clean it, but if it, if it looks a little bit bad, there's no need to throw it out. It just might be healthy for you in a completely different way. All right, so I got, I already prepared it all, but I got a couple dishes that really follow through. Oh, I got some wheatgrass here. This is, oh, I want to talk about that. Um, I'm not sure of the specific nutrients in wheatgrass, but I know it's a near superfood. It's it literally, it's what it sounds like. It is a grass. Um, it is not the most pleasant thing to eat straight out. Sometimes I will just cut, cut a chunk off and chew on it, and you feel like a cow, like with, with the curd in your mouth, because you just get this giant thing, and I just like chew the nutrients out and spit the rest of it out. But uh, I'm a big smoothie fan, if you can't tell. That's why I'm making it for you guys. <laughs> It's, uh, it's smoothies are a really easy way to get a lot of nutrients. What I have here is um, I actually wrote this one's recipe for it. We got some lime and some cucumber and some basil. As you can all see in there. Um, I and then this one is uh, I make this one all the time. It's one of my favorites. I call it my pineapple superfood. I threw the pineapple top in there. I would label I would label this part this low top part as a superfood. Um, we've got some organic cranberries from here. I normally try and go for uh, go for like aronia berries. I know are a really common one that's grown here in Nebraska. That is a definite superfood, super high on the nutrient content. Berries in general, though, right? Think about the seed. Think about a strawberry. Think about how many seeds cover a strawberry. That is a very healthy food for you. To eat. All kinds of berries will be. They're really high in sugar, but you know there's there's a lot of added benefits to it. And then I got some kale in here and some wheatgrass in here. And hopefully I can find a spoon to scoop this avocado out. Because one thing I want to do is uh, 
do a little comparison for you guys of something I call the health food swap, which is like I mentioned grains aren't good for you. I made I made cookies for my restaurant this morning actually, and I used garbanzo beans and gluten-free flour. I used equal parts of both, and they came out like it, it has a weird like chunky texture to it. But the garbanzo bean is it's a protein source that's a, it's a better protein source than the wheat. It has a lower amount of carbs in it than the wheat and it has a higher amount of nutrients than the wheat. So you can use garbanzo beans in a lot of cookies. You can use black beans and make brownies, black bean brownies. Uh, I'm actually going to have a whole class where all we do is bake, bake, bake dessert goods with, with alternative things in it. Uh, I use avocado in those cookies instead of, instead of oil, which avocado is, if you're a vegetarian, it's a, higher, it's a high source of omega-3s, so that's good for you. But not only that, it has a lower, it's a high fat content fruit, but it has a lower overall amount of fat than a comparable amount of, of oil would. So it's, it's a healthier fat, it's easier for you to digest, so on and so forth. And then when, when you put, specifically when avocado goes in smoothies, yogurt has, this, has a texture to it, right? Like when you put it in a smoothie and it just gets like really thick and really creamy and really delicious, so, avocado has a little bit different taste. Maybe it's a little bit less enjoyable than yogurt. Um, I would kind of argue, I know a lot of people who believe that. I, I eat this stuff all the time, so I'm just completely used to the taste. I don't think so at all. But, again, that's, that's me and it might not be you. But, uh, you know, dairy is just something very much to avoid most of the time. Again, here, it's better. Uh, you can trust RBGH, uh, rapid bovine growth hormone which makes cows produce more milk, even though the government is paying farmers not to produce milk. But it's actually illegal, right? RBGH is in the cows, so they make more milk. It's illegal to sell our milk and our cheese into Canada and Europe because RBGH causes cancer, and it is illegal in those countries. So again, here is, is a much better choice because you're, you can trust that this stuff is gonna be Organic yogurt is a good choice because it's probiotic. Probiotic is a word to look for. It means that there's living organisms inside of it, and pretty much when you're digesting it, it just goes straight into your gut. It turns around and starts digesting everything else. Really, really healthy stuff. But I want to have a taste comparison between these two because avocado is something that you can use instead of yogurt in a lot of recipes. So let's see. I think I have cups here for you guys. And then I got I got salad too, just because I've been up here talking about raw raw stuff. Um, the salad is fun. I made this dressing from scratch with these three ingredients, and hopefully I can find spoon <laughs> so you guys can can try it. Uh, processed salad dressing is a huge, huge, huge waste. Those three things: olive oil, balsamic vinegar, and black pepper will by itself be so mind-blowingly good and like really flavorful and you don't need to use that much. I also see a lot of people drowning drowning their salad in dressing. And if you try and do that with that, you're you're not going to eat very much. Hi. Right. Random kids. Love it. Alright, so if you guys want to come up here and grab a cup, we can throw this in and get some food.